So my talk is going to be in uh, machine learning in Node.js. So my name is Maximilian. I'm a computer scientist a student at Royal Holloway. I'm uh, currently doing a placement uh, as an IT intern at Berkman Wenzelers in web development, project management, GDPR compliance, and IT support. I'm not a data scientist. Um, so, so why I got into machine learning? Well, I was introduced to it in bioinformatics and malware, so managed software at the university. And I had a problem to solve on an open source project, being the all contributors CLI. Um, what I learned, well, there's a fair amount of libraries and tools, most of which are for deep learning or neural networks in general. It can be easy to implement or hard, depending on what you're trying to do. You don't need to know Python or R, um, or even MATLAB to basically get your machine learning model uh, up and running. The maths you've seen, uh, papers, machine learning uh, lectures, and all, all that stuff isn't really required, but nevertheless is helpful, uh, especially as a lot of things require a bit of maths background. So what is ML? So ML stands for machine learning. Um, Tom Mitchell so had this famous quote, which is, a computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks T and pressure P. If the specimens are in task T measured by P impressed with experience E. In simple language, machine learning is a field in which human-made algorithms have an ability to learn by themselves and predict the future for unseen data. So any of this AI, so that's a thing I see quite a lot of people still struggling with in different changing. So AI is a broad field where they aim to make uh, machines smart intelligence, and the artificial intelligence name. ML, as you can see in the graph here, is a subset of it, with deep learning being a subset. So some types and models you'll be um, using or encountering when you do machine learning is supervised, which is essentially where you have no known data were basically labeled where you know the answer, like a teacher who knows what's right, what's wrong, where you have classification, um, regression, basically for text and numbers respectively. You have unsupervised learning where you don't know the answer, but you want your machine learning model to basically find the structure or basically what's common between each data elements. The third one being reinforcement learning, which as the image here suggests is where you have an agent like a robot that does certain set of actions in an environment, say a map or like a game, and then you, the person, are you going to be rewarding it or punishing it depending on how it performed at said actions. Then onto the deep learning. So deep learning is a bit special because it can be done in a supervised or unsupervised way uh, with no networks. And you have semi-supervised learning, which as the name suggests is basically a mix of supervised and unsupervised learning. The only difference is that uh, you will have typically most of your data without any labels, so it'd be like an unsupervised learning approach, except you have some of your data with a label, say, I don't know, uh, element that has the answer, say, like a class or the price or whatever the output is. The last one is online learning. So this one can be used in a supervised or unsupervised approach. The only difference compared to the traditional supervised and unsupervised approaches is that instead of learning a whole data set of training uh, elements, it was going to be looking at one element and then learning from this and going on per element instead of going through a whole set and then learning from it. Why would you use machine learning in JavaScript? Well, the good things are you can use it directly in the browser as well as in Node.js environments. It's easier to integrate in code bases written in JavaScript or even TypeScript. Um, and the online learning is more incorporated as it's basically essentially just some JavaScript lines of code that you run within your web app code base or your mobile app or 
anything that basically runs a JavaScript system. It's easier to honest machine learning without having to know or even use Python, R, MATLAB, or any other classical machine learning languages and frameworks. The bad things about it, though, is that there's a lack of maturity and completeness in the libraries you have, um, basically because most of them are quite young compared to the um, Python R alternatives, most of which are faster, more efficient, namely because they were around for longer and they were experimented and trialed a lot more and them being usually more mature. You will be reinventing the wheel on some concept, but that's usually not a bad thing, but it's still something you need to bear in mind when you use machine learning and JavaScript. And the last thing is that some of the algorithms you'll need, like LSA, so latent semantical analysis, or Adaboost, aren't available yet, or at all, in JavaScript. So in libraries and tools, so there's quite a lot especially in, deep, uh, in the deep learning and neural network side of it, but some of the ones I've used are Limdo for classification, online learning, MLGJS, which seems to be the most popular one, which also can do a lot of things like clustering in unsupervised learning. Then you have things like LDA for dimension reduction, uh, BrainJS, uh, who some of you might have used in like a AIJS workshop. There's other things like Markov JS, reinforced JS for reinforcement learning, and so on. So, further ado, I'm going to do a demonstration using a library I made on top of Limdo to solve a multi class classification problem I was facing um, trying to automate uh, all contributors' CLI process. On the Node.js, you're going to first basically get the learner, so that's Then you're going to create your learner instance. So basically the object that is going to be uh, incorporating all the data sets, training sets, and all the things that will be allowing it to train and evaluate its knowledge on um, any new data or known data. So for the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to use the default um, parameters. So ACLearn comes with a data set uh, of about 486, last time I checked, of data being GitHub labels. So there's like uh, announcement, bug, uh, do not merge, and so on. Basically labels you'll see in issues, pull requests, and such. And it's going to be initializing training sets of about 70% of data um, and validation sets um, that we'll get into later on, and the training sets. So that's essentially what it looks like. So you have all the data with inputs being the GitHub label and the output being the answer, which is um, one of 28 um, or contributors labels here. So that's what the um, specification uses to classify contributions on repos or anything where you can apply the or contributor specification. So, yeah. and here you can see the classifier. So that part is what comes directly from Limdo, um, which is essentially a neural network that uses the winnow algorithm. So with further ado, I'm going to basically train it. So this library comes with the option of just training it with what we call a training function. But usually in machine learning, it's better to do what we call a cross-validation. So what cross-validation is that you're going to be taking a training set, so 70% of the data, and a validation set together. So basically, you're going to be mixing them and on a certain amount of iterations. So in, it's usually five, so I opted for the default option of five folds, so basically five loops, where each time the 
validation uh, items are going to be different from a loop to another. So I'm going to be training it. And then what it's going to be doing is it's going to be showing some st statistics that are um, coming from the, one of the modules of Lemdu. Uh, the top one being macro average. So what it is is that in machine learning you have um, several classes and when you use like more than two classes, micro averages will be basically the average of all these statistics such as accuracy, so how well did the model perform overall, precision, how many of the data it predicted as a certain label, say how many of the predictions where it said, oh, this is a bug label, uh, how many of those were correct. Recall how many of the, la um, in the case of bug labels, how many of the bug labels were correctly recalled as a bug label. And then you have F1 score, which is what we call the harmonic um, sum of both. So in the cases where you have classifiers, which says the exact same answer every time, say you give a hundred different answers and you say a bug every time, you might have like a high recall, but this precision might be like a lower zero, so really crap. So F1 score is usually where you see if it's close to zero, then it's really bad. If it's close to one, which in this case is about 90%, so it's pretty good, then uh, it's reliable. The next one is micro-average. So that's when you look at every single prediction uh, alone. So you have like true positive, which is where a label was correctly predicted as what the actual label is. True negative, where it said, uh, like um, when it's looking at bugs and say, okay, this label is not a bug and it turned out not to be a bug label. False positives, it's essentially where it says, okay, this is a bug label, but it's not. So it's, uh, so it's considered false positive in multi-class, uh, which is a bit different than in binary classification, which is a lot easier. Um, false negatives is when it failed to recognize something as a bug or a code or whichever, depending on which label you're looking at at the moment. And then you have more statistics like Hamming gain loss, but I'm not going to get into those ones. Next thing, so now you trained your learner uh, in recognizing validations and test ele um, training elements. But what about your test elements or any unseen data? Well, I'm going to show you an example. So there's an eval function which is basically going to take um, all the elements in the, tra in the test set, so about 15% of the data, and it's going to be basically evaluating it. So, yeah. so what you see here is categories, so you have talk, so that's the category, and then you have statistics for it, so like the sample portion, so how much of it were on the data set, how much of true positives, false negatives, and so on, accuracy. And then you have the contribution matrix, which is essentially a two by two array where you have two positive, false positive, false negatives, and, and false negatives. And then you have more general stats, like how many items there was in the test set, so in this case, 73. How many of the predictions were correct, so in this case, 44. And how many were incorrect, so 29. And you have the classes here, if you want to look at. You can also get um, the contribution matrix um, statistics alone. So I'm going to take it here. And the contribution matrix allows you to see it visually as you see in contribution matrices. So hence this screen might not be big enough considering it's about 28 by 28 um, grids to uh, display, I'm going to split it in two. Um, but, uh, so here, that's, for those of you who have never seen that country matrix, essentially where you have on one, on the first column you have all the labels which represent the actual labels that are basically in data sets with the answers and on the top one is that what the model predicted. The diagonal is 
uh, usually what the true positives for the correct prediction are. So green ones are the correct ones. Yellow are basically what you should have said. Oh, th that's a blog or a, and, and it's actually a blog, but it didn't find any, probably because there's no much data in the training set to be able to guess a uh, blog. Then you have red ones here, which are not in the diagonal. So that's where you have um, either false positive or false negative, depending on whether you're looking at it from the ideas or if you're looking at it from the maintenance perspective, which changes depending on whether it's a false positive or false negative, um, which is not that hard when you look at two uh, labels or basically binary classifications. Um, and with this, you can also get like the actual statistics that are calculated based on all the numbers here. So if you want to get the um, micro accuracy, or if you just want to short stats, like uh, some of the relevant and important statistics you usually look at when you uh, evaluate a machine learning model. So you have um, total, so how many elements, true, false, um, as before. Then you have the accuracy, precision, recall, and F1. So that's macro. You can also change if you want to have micro, which is usually the default, as in this case of uh, this library, the data set is quite imbalanced. And I'll, exp and I'll show you why in a bit. So you will usually use the micro, which usually accounts for imbalances. The third option is where you have weighted. So what weighted is, it's basically where you're going to be doing the same approach as macro, except you're going to be in count, uh, taking into account how many items of each classes are present in the data set, which means that it will be like not favoring like the biggest class over the one which is barely there. And so this, it's quite similar stack, so around 60% each. So it's quite good. Now, what if we wanted to see the actual chart? Um, so the bar size, so that's from code. So here you can see, so in blue, you have the training set. So uh, validations, green, and that's so. So that big one is null. So null is not a mistake. It's actually intentional. Um, it was just a way to represent labels that can't fit in any of the um, contribution labels here has in a GitHub issue, you might have things like in progress, which are completely relevant or don't mean anything toward if it's a code or a bug fix or documentation, translation, design or anything here. And here you can see all the repercussions. So some of them are really low, but that's because things like um, content, funding, finding, event organization are things you might not really see in GitHub because that's usually like in Eventbrite, meetup.com, Slack, or any other platforms which might not be um, available when you look at the GitHub repo alone because that's labels from GitHub. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, big round of applause.